The story of television begins in an unlikely way. The year was 1922. Ford's Model T sold faster than the factory could turn them out. Cities were buzzing with the newfound power of electricity. Early technology was transforming the landscape. Electricity was a revolution in science that had begun over 100 years before. In the early 1800s, Europeans like George Ohm and Heinrich Hertz, formerly trained scientists, slowly uncovered one of nature's most complex mysteries, electricity. In America, men like Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison turned electrical theory into mechanical reality. Inventions like the phonograph and the motion picture camera were the result of a little science and a lot of ingenuity. Men without formal training were making extraordinary breakthroughs. One such inventor was about to make a quantum leap in science. He was Guillermo Marconi, and in 1896, when he sent an electric impulse through thin air, wireless was born. Before Marconi, telegraph messages could only be sent to one location and only by wire. Now, completely wireless messages could be sent in all directions at once. The next challenge was to try and send a voice over the airwaves. In 1908, that's exactly what inventor Lee DeForest did. He broadcast the first human voice from the Eiffel Tower. He had invented a delicate and complex electronic device, the Audion Tube. By capturing electrons, it could transmit voice patterns over the airwaves. It was into this exciting world of invention that a 14-year-old boy came along who would become critical to the development of television. On a remote farm in Beaver, Utah, a Mormon schoolboy dreamed of taking DeForest's work a step further. Philo T. Farnsworth had no formal training in the new field of electronics, but as a teenager, he was destined to change the 20th century. Young Farnsworth was determined to come up with an electronic tube of his own, one that would carry both sound and pictures. Reading scientific journals by candlelight, he worked late into the night in an attempt to decode the complex phenomenon of particle physics. At 14, the young genius was ready to share his idea. While the other kids brought cut and paste objects to show and tell, Farnsworth brought something else. He put some of the equations for it on the blackboard and his professor said, his science professor said, what's that? And he said, well, it's a means of projecting television images over the radio. The theory was so complex that his teacher sent Farnsworth to Brigham Young University to see if the boy was crazy or a genius. At the university, the scientists were astonished. Basically, the idea was that an image would be read by a lens and captured on a plate. The image on the plate would be scanned by a beam of lightning-fast electrons emanating from a cathode ray tube. Electrons would bounce back off the plate, representing light and dark areas of the image. The electrons in the tube would be converted into an electric impulse, which could then be sent to a transmitter and out over the airways. This image would, in turn, be carried to a receiver. The image, or signal, would be amplified and beamed onto the inside of the chemically treated tube, in much the same way it had been captured. This was the televised image. But television would take a long, difficult journey from the drawing board to the living room. Unfortunately, Philo Farnsworth would have to wait to prove his theory. After a year in college, his father's death forced him to drop out of school and seek work. It looked as though the young inventor would never get the opportunity to actually create his television. Across the country, a different kind of genius was about to embark on a path towards his career in television. David Sarnoff would do more than anyone else to shape the future of television. And considering where he started, it's remarkable that he ever got the chance. At 14, the young Russian immigrant wanted to escape the grinding poverty of New York's teeming Lower East Side. Forced to drop out of school and look for a job, a lucky twist of fate would alter Sarnoff's future. A wrong turn on the way to an interview landed him in the offices of American Marconi, the inventor of the wireless. Marconi needed a messenger and Sarnoff needed a job, but he got more than expected from the chance encounter. 
And he said from the first day, there was something almost hypnotic about wireless to him. Because Marconi was his idol. He dressed the way Marconi dressed. Used the cane that Marconi used. Gloves, suits, things like that. He idolized them. Sarnoff had an intuitive feeling for the new world of electronics. He wasn't an inventor, but he possessed his own unique gifts. And one of these gifts was a pension for promotion. According to legend, on the night of April 15, 1912, Sarnoff was manning the Marconi relay station in New York when he picked up an urgent message. A boat was sinking in the Atlantic. It was the Titanic. Sarnoff worked the wireless key for three straight nights, alerting other ships in the area. Years later, it was established that the story may have been partly myth. Nonetheless, Sarnoff repeated the story so often it gained currency and gained Sarnoff a reputation. As Sarnoff worked his way up the ranks at Marconi, more and more people began using the airwaves to send messages. The problem was that the space for sending signals was limited, which caused interference. The airwaves needed to be organized or chaos would result. So, the government stepped in to solve the problem. Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, gathered all the companies with a stake in this new phenomenon called wireless. Together, they formed a trust called RCA. The idea was to put all of broadcasting's eggs in one basket and then watch that basket. RCA's first step was to buy out Marconi's American operation, keeping it under American control. RCA got a better deal than they realized. Marconi Company came with the self-assured, determined David Sarnoff. He had vast self-confidence. He had the biggest ego of any man I've ever seen. It's hard to believe, but he once told me, he said, I've never known fear. Now, that <laughs> to me is, 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 is a remarkable statement, but he said it as though he, he, he really believed it. Sarnoff would one day become the father of television, but first he would transform radio. At 22, Sarnoff outlined his vision for radio in a brief document known as the Radio Box Memo. Sarnoff envisioned a device in the home where people could receive music, news, and sports. The memo outlined an organized system of regular programming five years before it happened. But Sarnoff's idea received a cool reception. The technical challenges hadn't yet been overcome. And even though it was possible to broadcast voice and music, why would anyone want to? While Sarnoff struggled to gain acceptance, Philo Farnsworth was still looking for a break in Salt Lake City. As with all great inventors, luck was about to play a fateful role. One of his bosses introduced Farnsworth to wealthy friends. Farnsworth's idea for television captivated them, and they agreed to finance his work. Farnsworth moved to Los Angeles where he could find necessary materials. The young inventor had to invent whole new tools just to proceed. He mixed chemicals, even blew the glass for his experimental tubes, all in utmost secrecy. He was concerned someone might steal the idea and file for precious patents. Farnsworth spent every waking moment trying to perfect his new invention. He confessed to his new bride, Pan, there's another woman in my life and her name is television. Farnsworth was close to creating a working television, but the clock was ticking. He wasn't the only inventor trying to solve the mystery. He had competition respected scientists who were close at his heels. In 1920, while Farnsworth struggled with his idea for television, radio began finding its voice. In Pittsburgh, a Westinghouse engineer named Frank Conrad began experimental radio broadcasts with voice and music. From the Westinghouse rooftop on Election Day, November 2nd, the first radio station in America, KDKA, went on the air. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us, and we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching. The idea, a long time coming, caught on, and broadcast fever had begun. At RCA, Sarnoff wasn't surprised. He'd known it all along, and Westinghouse's success proved him right. 
The demand for radios, transmitters, towers, and stations exploded, and so did the financial rewards. RCA now looked to Sarnoff to transform their wireless business into radio. Radio improved the value of the broadcasting. Philo Farnsworth wanted to prove that images, too, could be transmitted. The race for television was heating up. In the 1920s, America was dancing to Charleston. Prohibition was casting its dry shadow, and radio was the toast of the town. Young David Sarnoff's brilliance was rewarded with a lucrative position at RCA. But soon, he had begun casting his visionary eye across the technological landscape. It came to rest on television. And Farnsworth now had company. Real scientists were getting into the race for television. One of them, a brilliant Russian immigrant named Vladimir Zaworykin, had begun to figure out the puzzle of television at precisely the same time as Farnsworth. Remarkably, the two men's experiments were nearly identical in concept. Zworkin was quickly making a name for himself in an unlikely way. One of his experiments blew up, and that's how his bosses first uh, took notice of him. Uh, Zworkin always liked to push the edges in his experiments, which is part of the reason why he hit on the uh, invention of television. The brash young scientist tried to get Westinghouse to fully back his invention, but the conservative company wasn't interested in Zwarikin's wild idea, and television was in a highly experimental stage. Scientists hadn't yet agreed on a standard system for the television. In theory, there were two possible ways to capture and reproduce an image. Both Zwarikin and Farnsworth's electronic television relied on tiny charged electrons scanning and then amplifying the image. The competitor was mechanical television, which relied on a rotating disc with small holes. Light beam through these rotating holes could also create television scan lines. Mechanical television was less complex, but electronic had the potential to create a far better image. Convinced electronic could work, Farnsworth moved to San Francisco, where the wealthy banker W.H. Crocker backed his plan to develop the potentially superior electronic television system. In 1925, after five years of hard work, Farnsworth was ready. He set up a demonstration guaranteed to thrill the public and capture the world's attention. Farnsworth invited the wildly popular Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks up from Los Angeles to be part of the demonstration in San Francisco. Unfortunately, things didn't go quite as planned. Farnsworth had the demonstration all set up. It worked perfectly in rehearsal, and then when these super celebrities from Hollywood sat down, the whole thing didn't happen. The screen went blank, and the celebrities went back, convinced, like the rest of the nation, that there was no future in television. Farnsworth needed to produce results quickly. His failed demonstration worried his backers. The pressure was growing. Others were placing their bets on mechanical television. Mechanical television's great proponent was Charles Francis Jenkins. He was a highly respected inventor of the self-starting engine and the 35 millimeter motion picture projector. Jenkins' fast work and flair for publicity put him out ahead of the pack very quickly. In a 1927 publicity coup, Jenkins unveiled the first long-distance television transmission in history. Jenkins convinced Herbert Hoover, then Secretary of Commerce, to take part in sending an intercity television image from Washington to New York. After first burning his forehead on the hot lights, a crude 48-line image appeared on the screen. The future president spoke for two minutes, followed by his wife. She was concerned the device not be used to read minds. Mechanical television had struck the first blow. But scientists took Farnsworth's work in electronic television seriously. England was becoming the first battleground to decide the future format of television. England had its own inventor, James Baird an eccentric Scotsman, best known for his invention of the electric sock for soldiers in World War I. 
As early as 1923, Baird had built a working mechanical television, and he was about to convince the BBC to adopt mechanical as the standard for England. But before they endorsed Baird's plan, the BBC wanted to see this electronic TV of Philo Farnsworth. Both men were invited to demonstrate their competing systems. When the momentous day came, Baird showed his television first to enthusiastic response. While Farnsworth began his demonstration in the next room, Baird was unprepared for what he saw next. And out of the corner of his eye, he caught the Farnsworth image on a very large screen. And he just stopped mid-sentence and wandered away from the people he was talking to back into the open door to get a clearer look at this incredibly superior image that Farnsworth had produced. And uh, Baird knew at that moment that he would just be a footnote in television history. The next day, British Parliament voted to license Farnsworth's system. Baird was devastated. Television was still in its infancy. An image had barely been transmitted. But a few people were able to catch a glimpse of this new invention, including a young high school student who would make his own impact on television. 1933, at the World's Fair in Chicago, with a group of us who saved our money and went up from Houston, Texas to Chicago, and they had an exhibit of television there. I was one of those who volunteered to get up and have my picture taken, and it was shown on the other side of the room with great amazement of everybody present. Philo Farnsworth was America's boy genius of television, but he had competition. The explosive and brilliant physicist Zworkin was every bit his equal. At Westinghouse, Zwarikin's ideas fell on deaf ears, but his luck was about to change. Zwarikin decided to pitch his idea to David Sarnoff at RCA, a meeting that would change the course of broadcasting history. Sarnoff had an intuitive understanding for the vast potential of television. In Zwarikin, he found a technological soulmate, someone capable of making the idea a working reality. Soon, Zwarikin began working for Sarnoff. Philo T. Farnsworth now had serious competition. Zwarikin now had the megalith RCA behind him. Both men claimed they had invented television, and both men were right. Since Farnsworth and Zwarikin had done their work concurrently, the patent courts would have to decide who had been first. The deciding factor was Farnsworth's high school science teacher. He had copied the drawings of the 14-year-old boy off a Utah blackboard. This was proof that Farnsworth's ideas had come first. Farnsworth got his patents. The small-town farm boy had taken on the giant corporation and won. RCA now needed Farnsworth's patents to further develop television. They tried to pressure Farnsworth to sell his new patents to RCA, but Farnsworth wanted continuous royalties. Sarnoff had never allowed such a thing. RCA had built their entire fortune on ownership of patents. Sarnoff did all he could to intimidate the 24-year-old inventor. The General Sarnoff had a very dominant type of personality. I've seen people absolutely terrorized by him. Uh, he often used to say, I give ulcers, I don't get them. Farnsworth wasn't intimidated. He held his ground under increasing pressure. For once, Sarnoff had met his match. Sarnoff gave in, and for several years, Farnsworth received royalties from RCA. Sarnoff now had control of the patents that would help him reach his dream of a television in every home. But events were about to show him just how daunting a challenge lay ahead. By the early 1930s, David Sarnoff was the king of the radio airwaves. RCA was selling millions of radios. They also owned the two biggest networks, NBC Blue and NBC Red. But Sarnoff had bigger plans. Sarnoff's vision for television simply was that he expected it to be in most American homes in the 1930s, now the 1950s, because the technology was there. Sarnoff had Zworkin's system, and he was ready to promote it. The obstacles were greater than Sarnoff knew. TV signals could be sent by coaxial cable, but there was no reliable way to send the signal by broadcast. 
Besides, there was almost no public demand. Who needed pictures when you had radio? Long as baby must grow, I promise him my... Radio fever was sweeping the nation, and Sarnoff faced a new threat. A man who would challenge him first in radio, then in television. The man was William S. Paley. Unlike Sarnoff, Paley was born into wealth. The son of a cigar magnate, Paley had been given a gift in 1928, a fledgling radio network called CBS. Great cars. Plymouth. Paley was a natural-born showman. He had little interest in the science of television, but he'd keep Sarnoff on his toes with his programming genius. The two men were fierce competitors and also had great respect for one another. This tension would help shape both radio and television, but for now, television was still hampered. Pictures were not sharp, and sending a consistent signal was still difficult. Engineers had to learn how to send the TV signal through trees and buildings and hills. Interference was everywhere. Even the electronic pulse from a car spark plug could interrupt the television signal. Scientists worked day and night trying to solve the problem. They made progress, but the price tag was alarming. Sarnoff had spent millions, and he was about to spend more. Other executives thought he was crazy, but Sarnoff was eager to begin broadcasting. On the third floor of Radio City, Studio 3H was converted for television broadcast. Sarnoff, the perfectionist, was there to oversee all the details. On July 7, 1936, using the call letters W2XBS, a highly experimental broadcast was attempted. Members of the press and ad agency executives sat in front of TVs set up in Radio City. On screen, they saw dancers, singers, speeches, and films of army maneuvers to cover set changes. Performers had to wear green and purple makeup for the camera to capture their faces. Temperatures from the hot lights soared. So at the end of this historic telecast, uh, Sarnoff uh, was soaking wet. The lights were so hot. He had, in fact, changed his shirt three times during the telecast. The next day, the Herald Tribune sneered at the blurred and foggy images. But the Times found the demonstration extremely interesting. Television still had technical and talent problems to overcome. To solve them, Sarnoff mobilized his team of researchers and turned the city of New York into a research laboratory. Television would work. Sarnoff would make sure of that. Every kind of programming was tried. Here, a cameraman captures on film the very first television drama. Sets were rickety, the acting was over-exaggerated, and the lights were so hot that bits of paper, which were supposed to look like snow, stuck to the effusively sweating actors. In Radio City, the Rockettes were brought in for a broadcast, but had to be sent away. Only a handful would fit on the screen at one time. Finding talent wasn't easy. At first, television was a stigma for actors. Even an unknown out-of-work singer named Frank Sinatra turned down television offers. He didn't think there was much of a future in it. And by the late 1930s, it looked like television might not catch on. Programming was intermittent, sets were expensive, the signal was weak, radio was still king. At CBS Radio, Paley was now pulling ahead of Sarnoff and NBC. He had pulled in the best dramatists and newsmen to CBS with Edward R. Murrow and Orson Welles, and audiences responded. Sarnoff needed a public relations coup to take back the momentum. He soon found the perfect forum to sell his idea of television to a curious but skeptical public. 26 million people visited the New York World's Fair of 1939. I hereby dedicate the world's fair, and I declare it open to all mankind. The 1939 World's Fair was a momentous occasion in television history. Most of the public had heard of television. Few had actually seen it. The theme was the future, and the biggest corporations gathered to unveil the most sophisticated technological breakthroughs. The world's first fluorescent bulb, Nylon stockings, Wonder Bread, even a newfangled invention called plastic amazed the public. 
At RCA's pavilion, fairgoers could view television. For a small fortune, they could take one home. David Sarnoff took the occasion to announce the beginning of regular broadcasting in America. The historic moment was captured on audio tape. It is with a feeling of humbleness that I come to this moment of announcing the birth in this country of a new art so important in its implications that it is bound to affect all society. For two hours a week, the people of New York could now tune into regular broadcasts on NBC. There were no Nielsen ratings. No one knew who Lucille Ball or Jackie Gleason or Walter Cronkite were. There were only 200 sets in all of New York. But television was now a reality. Philo T. Farnsworth was mentioned at the World's Fair for his invention of the world's first incubator. The inventor who had done so much for television was all but forgotten. When Farnsworth, in retreat at his New England lake, heard that Sarnoff had taken credit for the birth of television, he remarked, the baby has been born with a beard. Progress in production methods for TV was slow. Even early attempts at commercials were fraught with production hazards. Ford, for example, tried to do an arty shot of a new 1940 Ford or 41 Ford uh, behind a fishbowl. And they forgot about how hot the studio lights would be. And so this very arty shot suddenly went on the air with a lot of dead fish at the bottom of a fishbowl because they'd been killed by the water, which had actually been brought up to a boiling level by the studio lights. Your throat can tell. It's Despite the problems, broadcasting was emerging as a powerful and potent social force, and Washington was taking notice. The Federal Communications Commission had been formed to help shape radio and television. In 1940, the new FCC chairman, James Fly, wanted to keep a strong hand over the emerging world of television. Fly felt Sarnoff had become too influential, too monopolistic. He pushed an antitrust law through Congress to weaken Sarnoff's stranglehold on the broadcast industry. Sarnoff wasn't prepared for this fight. He had cultivated scientists and entertained presidents. Congressmen were unfamiliar adversaries. The FCC's actions forced Sarnoff to sell one of RCA's two NBC networks. Lifesaver magnate Edwin Noble bought it and turned it into the fledgling ABC. The defeat taught Sarnoff a valuable lesson. The next time the government came between him and his plans for a television in every home, he would be prepared. By the mid-1940s, the troops were coming home from war, and America was about to enter an era of prosperity and growth unparalleled in history. America was working harder and playing harder, and television would soon become a favorite pastime. By now, the technology was improving steadily. At RCA, Vladimir Zworkin invented a more efficient camera tube that could capture an image with fewer hot lights. The signal was being improved in part the result of progress made in battlefield communications. But progress had created problems. There were no picture quality standards, almost no programming, and very few sets. Limited to bars and department store windows, television tantalized, promising the wonders of technology. And proud set owners explained television to admiring friends. There will probably be as many of these amateur explanations as there are set owners. But television was a wonderland few Americans could afford. RCA, under Sarnoff's guidance, was out ahead of the pack. But an upstart businessman from New Jersey named Alan B. Dumont was putting pressure on RCA. Dumont had a budding TV network. He also had a superior TV set with 600 lines of clear picture resolution. Sarnoff's old nemesis at the FCC, James Fly, hadn't yet decided on a standard. Would American TVs have RCA's 450 lines or Dumont's 600 lines? This critically important decision would determine how the signal would be sent and received, giving the owner of that particular system an edge. Sarnoff wanted his 450 line standard. Fly again tried to stop him, but this time the wily Sarnoff knew what to do. He cajoled Washington, now aware of the budding influence of TV. And eventually, he got what he wanted. Sarnoff's 450 lines were approved by the FCC. 
After two decades of development, Sarnoff's dream of a television in every home was still just that, a dream. And developing TV hadn't been cheap. It was a black hole sucking in $200 million in research and development. And there was very little to show in return. Only $5 million in sets had been made. Sarnoff was so desperate that he would form an odd alliance with his rival broadcaster, Alan Dumont. The Dumont network had a superior field operation, and RCA had promotion. Together, Dumont and RCA arranged to broadcast the World Series of 1947. The historic series was captured by a young director, Harry Coyle, who experimented with multiple cameras, setting a precedent for sports coverage. The experimental broadcast worked beyond anyone's wildest imagination. All over New York, department stores and bars were filled with transfixed viewers. Each game was more dramatic than the next. The bars and the appliance store windows are packed so thick that Paley, driving by in his limousine, had to ask the driver what that big crowd was. And when he was told there was people watching television, he actually asked the driver to stop, and he got out and walked over and stood in the back of the crowd to see what could keep people so fixed. With this historic first, television came of age. Suddenly, the doomsdayers began changing their minds. Maybe television could compete with radio. The demand for sets began to grow, but for most Americans, the cost was still too high. But that was about to change. Los Angeles car dealer Earl Madman Munz, who had earned his name with his wacky promotional stunts, stepped in. The prospect for TV got his salesman's blood going. In 1948, Munz checked into New York's Warwick Hotel. He had a new set from each manufacturer delivered to his room. He tuned into a station and then systematically tested and interchanged parts. Within one day, he had created a stripped-down set. Back in L.A., Muntz bought wholesale parts and the Muntz TV was born. The price? $170, hundreds less than his competitors. In no time, sales took off and others were forced to lower their prices. By the end of 1949, there were 4 million sets in America. So amazed were the new viewers, many were content to just stare at the test pattern. There were very few shows, and those that were broadcast often didn't come in well. Now that many of the technical and legal challenges had been overcome, the search for talent was on. Executives didn't have to look very far. Vaudeville, a dying institution, was resuscitated. It was a talent pool America couldn't resist. Milton Berle, Bob Hope, Jerry Lewis, and Dean Martin were suddenly visitors in living rooms all across America. I want to say that it's a great, great thrill to get back on television. I've, uh, uh, this is my third, I've had three shots on television. Fortunately, they all missed me, but I must say. Stars were being well, created you. overnight. Some made it, and some didn't. It's an easy way to find out. One popular producer, Mike Stokey, hired an aspiring actress named Norma Jean. He had gotten her name from the UCLA bulletin board. So she worked very hard in rehearsal, memorized her lines, and on the air, she got stage fright and forgot her lines, and Stokey had to talk her through it, and finally, at the end of the show, when the light on the camera went off, she collapsed into tears and said, Oh, Mr. Stokey, I'll never be an actress. I'm a complete failure. A year later, Norma Jean was Marilyn Monroe, a star too big for the small screen. To attract viewers, the TV camera had to take them places they'd never been before. One draw was the first televised tour of the White House, personally conducted by President Truman. In the old days, it was really, it was really ghastly. Tons of equipment and lights, heavy and lights. So on the White House tour with President Truman, which was the first time television was permitted in the White House, uh, it, uh, that was one of the problems we had to overcome in convincing the White House to let us in there at all. This demand for real-life events on television presented both an obstacle and an opportunity. If life was in color, why was TV limited to black and white? There were 11 million sets by 1950, all of them black and white. For Sarnoff, Paley, and Dumont, color was the new challenge.
The complex notion of breaking down the spectrum of color into manageable rays of electrons was a technological Mount Everest. Whoever managed to solve the problem first would wield tremendous power. CBS, RCA, and Dumont all put small armies of engineers to work on color. David Sarnoff had faced many battles, but none more fierce than the battle for color television. He often said, competition brings out the best in products and the worst in men. And he thought that the battle for color brought out really the toughest, meanest slugfest he'd ever encountered. Haley had gotten off to a head start in the battle for color. During World War II, he had spent money developing a simple, efficient, mechanical version of color. In lab tests, Paley's color version was impressive. So impressive, the FCC decided to give Paley the license for color. CBS was poised to sell millions of mechanical color television sets and beat Sarnoff to the punch. But Sarnoff put up a fight. He pointed out that Paley's mechanical color set was incompatible with the millions of electronic black and white sets already in use. He felt that new color programs should also be received on old black and white sets. After all, electronic television was the standard format. Why go back to mechanical TV for color? Sarnoff believed his engineers could develop an electronic color television. The battle would go all the way to the Supreme Court, and again, Sarnoff would lose this fight. But he refused to give up. He gathered us all together, and he said, regardless of what the Supreme Court said, this system won't work. It can't be the television of the future. We're going to go ahead with the development of all electronic color television. Sarnoff organized his engineers and physicists into an operation with the feel and precision of a military operation. The fight for color would determine the future, not just of television, but computers, microsurgery, and even space exploration. A lot of money and prestige were at stake. By the early 1950s, the country was in the grip of a cold war. Hula hoops and drive-ins were sweeping the nation. There were millions of television sets in American homes. And David Sarnoff and William Paley were locked in fierce battle for control over each and every one. Color was the key. Sarnoff was undeterred by his setbacks in developing color. Most thought it was impossible, not Sarnoff. At RCA, he pushed his scientists, driving them to invent electronic color television. Sarnoff was down here day after day, standing, standing under the white hot lights, working with the scientists. A top American industrialist down in shirt sleeves, sweating, down there, pushing the scientists, urging them on. Get something off the breadboard for me. RCA finally did it. They invented a whole new process. Inside the camera, through an ingenious array of mirrors, the image was broken down into the three primary colors and sent into three different tubes. When the electrons came back together, they would accurately reflect the true color image. The development of a tricolor picture tube took years. Even today, it's still considered one of the most amazing feats in industrial history. The FCC had no choice but to declare Sarnoff's version the new standard. Once again, the general had triumphed. Color TV was introduced on the market in 1954, but before color took off, television would begin its golden age of programming, and William Paley was blazing the trail. I, I, no talk. You must never talk when you're playing golf. <coughs> now, don't cough either. Now, look at me. Look at me. <coughs> Thanks in part to Paley, the tube was transforming the way America lived. There was a vividness to it and a mood to it, the suspense that television could offer by bringing it into your home in a raw, unpackaged state with no one knowing what the outcome would be was uh, made it almost addictive for many Americans. The impact was felt in every part of life. In New York, during the Jack Benny show, water usage dropped dramatically, then promptly surged when it was over. On Thursday nights, restaurants saw business drop off by 8 o'clock as people rushed home for Amos and Andy. Soon, audiences learned the new medium could be used to distort as well as to entertain. TV experienced growing pains, forcing the industry to change and grow up. On November 2nd, 1959, former quiz show contestant Charles Van Doren appeared before a House subcommittee. 
winner of $129,000, Van Dorn admitted that program officials had supplied him with questions and answers. Americans were learning not to trust the message, even if they loved the medium. Sputnik had shocked a confident America and launched a national race for space. Sarnoff, the Russian immigrant, was determined to help America prove her mettle. As he had done so often before, Sarnoff led the charge, inspiring his scientists to find a way to send a signal through the atmosphere. After years of hard work, they were finally successful. Once in orbit, Telstar picks up a signal from Earth, magnifies it 10 billion times, and relays it through a receiving station. Pictures that were broadcast from the U.S. to Europe and back at remarkable clarity. The world was being brought together in ways undreamed of by television's original inventors. People shared triumph and tragedy together, all through this electronic box. It's a, a powerful medium when, uh, when the, the chips are down emotionally or politically. The uh, assassination of President Kennedy was very much of a case in point. An entire nation gathered around their television sets. And perhaps there was an even greater immediacy because the young president was so much better known thanks to television. Almost any event, no matter how remote, was now brought directly into the homes of millions in all its raw power. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon. As viewers absorbed worldwide events in the intimacy of their homes, few had ever heard of the men who made this stunning act of magic possible. The boy genius Philo T. Farnsworth was all but forgotten. When he appeared on Gary Moore's I've Got a Secret, the contestant couldn't even identify him. Philo had to tell him, I was the man who invented television. The genius farm boy died in 1970 at the age of 64, depressed and in ill health. The last 10 years of his life, it was said he didn't want the word television uttered in his home. David Sarnoff, his place in history secure, could sit back and look at how his passion for television had changed the world. The boy who began with a Morse code key late in his life helped arrange telecasts from the moon. Late in his life, Sarnoff was still able to peer far into the future. As early as 1949, he envisioned the world of wireless phone, fax, and image. Pocket-sized radio instruments will enable individuals to communicate with anyone, anywhere. All through the 1950s and 60s, Sarnoff kept up his unique partnership with Vladimir Zwerkin. The young scientist from St. Petersburg had once beamed electron particles as horse and buggies passed by his window. Now he was pushing the edges of interstellar microcircuitry. The two men often looked back with nostalgia on their fortuitous first meeting in 1923. You were a good salesman, and I was a good dreamer. What began as fantasies, Sarnoff, Zorkin, Farnsworth, and countless others turned into a reality that continues to shape our lives. No one can deny the impact it has had on the world. Television has totally homogenized our culture. The corollary of that, however, is that it has brought people closer together so that we understand each other much better than we ever did before. What once seemed like an unimaginable miracle is now part of everyday life. This small box has made a huge impact on life in every corner of the globe. Our world has grown smaller because of television, and our view of it has grown immeasurably larger.